guys, my name's Amanda. I work with Dr. Greenfield. I'm one of the physician assistants with the group and I'm the Chiari Care Coordinator. We're really excited to present this lecture in conjunction with Bobby Jones CSF. Um, this program is called, I've been diagnosed, now what? Um, and this is meant to be a patient's and parent's perspective on what it means to be diagnosed with Chiari and provide a little bit of insight throughout their Chiari journey. Um, we have welcomed two families. I have Iz Izzy, I think she prefers Izzy, and mom Liz. Uh, they're from New Jersey, and Izzy is so sweet. She's three weeks post-op from a bone-only decompression, and we can talk about the logistics later. And then I have Parker over here and mom Jen. They join us from Georgia, and they had a dural opening. Um, decompression. And like I said, we'll talk about the logistics in a little bit, but we're really excited to have them. Um, I think we should give them a little round of applause for coming out of their way for us. Um, and we have Mary and Caitlin from Bobby Jones CSF. We couldn't have done this without them. And then we have our star, Dr. Jeffrey Greenfield, our Chiari <laughs> surgeon extraordinaire. I turn this over to him. He's going to give a few words and then we'll get started with the uh, questions. All right. I was going to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, it, 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 um, oh, we're going to use the microphone? Okay. Of course. Is this okay in terms of the room? Um, it, it, uh, it does need to be said that Amanda um, is probably the most important person in this room now. She says it's me, but it's, um, you know, it's a really just a little anecdote here to start the evening, but we, you know, in academic medicine, we, we do a lot of program building and uh, mentorship. And one of the things we do in our department is every um, five to 10 years, we do this analysis of where we can build, where we think we have strengths, where we have weaknesses. And we have one coming up. And so I said, let me pull up my last one from 2013. And the um, first page of this, you know, sort of internal reflection was, opportunity to build a Kiyomori program and went through all of the reasons why this was necessary in the New York City area and nationally and what we thought we could do and why there was a void there. Um, and so I didn't quite realize it had been 10 years. And so this 10 years and about 700 surgeries um, and, a, and a hopefully, you know, a really a nationally renowned program that takes care of the whole spectrum of patients with, with Kiyomori and all the associated disorders. So. It's been an, a really interesting 10-year journey. Um, and as part of that growth in the program, um, we've done a lot of research, um, a lot of publications. We published somewhere around 25 or 30 scientific journal articles about this. And we give tons of talks. And they're all over the Bobby Jones website and all over YouTube. You can find so much information about PRI these days that when I thought about what we could potentially talk about today, I immediately thought, well, maybe let's not do a science talk for once. There's a lot of that out there. Um, let's talk about something that I hear a lot from my patients, which is um, sort of the confusion and the um, sort of internal disarray that accompanies a new diagnosis and the fear that comes with being told that your child has a, a brain condition. Um, and then sort of the idea of I've been diagnosed, what next sort of arose from that. Um, and as part of that, I thought it would be way better to hear from people that have been through it than another talk by me. So I would love to be a part of the conversation and share things from my perspective about how I see the workup and what's necessary and what's not necessary, myths that people talk about, um, the, the journey from my side will be helpful, but only to reinforce the journey that um, Izzy and Parker will share about, um, you know, how it's been getting diagnosed and getting through to the other side of, of surgery. So that's, was, that was my hope here. We have asked for and received a ton of questions online with, through Bobby Jones that there's no way we'll be able to get through in its entirety. Maybe I'll be able to do a little, you know, Facebook Live or something and answer some of the questions, you know, after this if we don't get through to them. Um, but certainly we want this to be interactive um, and hopefully we can gender a nice conversation. And the goal here for everyone on the panel is to um, provide insights and counsel that you think will help other people going through what you just went through to the kids and the parents. Um, and we'll do our best in trying to provide insight into what we think makes a productive visit with your neurosurgeon. Um, I think it's really important 
sort of recognize this is not about us here at Wild Cornell. We're providing this as a resource, but 99.9% .9 of the people that are viewing this are not going to be having surgery with us. This is how do you approach your neurosurgeon where you live in the country or the world? What are the resources you have available? What are the testing that you need? And then how do you go about making a decision about surgery? So I don't want to talk too much, but this is not about me. But I thought that'd be a good sort of preamble for what the goal of tonight so that we can sort of keep it on topic. So with that, maybe I'll hand it back over to our MC. Yeah, Amanda. that sounds Thank great. You. So I figured we'd start linearly all the way from the beginning with what symptoms led to your diagnosis, how long did it take, and ultimately, how did you feel when you found that diagnosis? You want to start, Izzy, for mom? Oh, uh, my mom <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Liz. Um, we basically hit the uh, the lottery when we found Greenfield. Um, so Izzy's been out of nowhere, was diagnosed with scoliosis, and she instantly she went through her growth spurt uh, between the ages of eight and a half and ten. And she basically she had gained uh, she grew five and a half inches, gained thirty pounds. So she had fell off her velocity chart, and at the ten year old checkup. Um, she was not, she was screened for scoliosis, nothing. We even went to an endocrinologist, screened for scoliosis, nothing. Um, and so we were just waiting to see, um, you know, what the next steps were. And she basically, you know, let's wait and see what happens in six months if she gets her first period, and then we'll know more about, um, her bone age was 11 at 10, so it was sort of like, okay, maybe nothing's wrong. So she did in six months. We go to her 11 year old checkup, and all of a sudden, my doctor and teacher just like, oh, that's weird. She sort of has a little bit of a curve. And she's like, it's under 20 degrees. She checked her twice because there was no indication ever before. So she said, you know what? Why don't you just go to the orthopedic? Because uh, my mother-in-law has scoliosis. So we just said, all right, whatever. Um, she's a dancer. She's um, a singer. She's a theater arts performer. She had just done competitions this past uh, spring, she was in nine numbers. So when she hasn't had any issues, is she my headache kid? Yes, absolutely. I just thought she was just a headache kid. I mean, it was nothing ever like horrible. Um, always since she's, I would say seven, eight years old, like I never knew a kid that needed more massages than her. I'm like, I need a massage. It was like, <laughs> massage my neck. Like it just, I'm like, really? And she was always so tight for a little kid. Like, I mean, <laughs> and she's so super flexible. Again, didn't think anything of it. Um, she's always been ADHD. I had a formal evaluation last spring um, because uh, she was going into middle school and I realized, okay, normally I'm an educator, I have two masters. I was always able to work with teachers with the little nuances that Izzy can have in the classroom. And so, and we've been very successful, but knowing she was going into middle school with eight teachers, I said, oh, I don't know about this. So I needed to get the 509 and, um, even though I could have told them everything she needed, but you gotta have paperwork, you know. <laughs> and I, so then, but I didn't notice in the last year, certain areas of her ADHD, certain cognitive areas, would, got, just got worse. Like her short-term memory, um, concentration, is that issues considered uh, inattentive ADHD. Her, again, her scores now, she scored her overall IQ was 139, and all of her sub scores were over 95%, except for two. The visual dexterity was at 90%, which still, yes, that's good, but in comparison, they had to do an extended scale because her other scores were so high, and then processing speed. So, and she scored the least in her uh, motor skills, her hand motor skills um, with the uh, pegboard and stuff, that 54%. Again, I only say this now because it's in hindsight, it's like, oh, these are things that he already could affect. Who thought? I mean, I didn't, nobody didn't even think of it. So we finally go, uh, we saw the doctor in June. I finally made it to the other, I didn't run there. I'm thinking, whatever, right? October we go, and he takes an x-ray, she's got a 32 week curve all of a sudden on her thoracic. I'm like, what? It was like nothing before. We decided we're gonna watch and wait. Okay, fine. Three months later, we go back, and now it's a double curve, with the worst curve being at 37. Now, again, that was three months. But they took her growth plates, and so her tana, which is your, your hand plate, your joints, was between a seven and an eight. The most is eight. 
her rizzo, which is your hip, especially with girls, is between zero and five. Hers was five. She was practically fully grown. So this is not your typical idiopathic adolescent scoliosis. Usually they go through the growth spurt, they might get a curve, they go through the third stops, and then usually the scoliosis stops. Well, she's done with growth spurt and everything, and she didn't even grow at all in the middle of all this, and yet her curve is just going. So at that point, we got the brace, we went to a specialist, another x-ray, now is the third curve. The lumbar is, uh, I guess, compensating, so now we have a 25 degree. And the worst one now is at 38. Six more degrees, seven more degrees, she's gotta get spinal fusion, and she's a dancer. So he said, you know what? And I, as much as I don't like my scoliosis doctor, because we argue all the time, she'll tell you, um, he did say, let's get an MRI, because something's not right here. And we were looking for maybe a tumor. My sister and I both had one nomas, rare tumors. I mean, the baby's genetic, who knows? He mentioned possibly Chiari, which I knew nothing what that was. Sure enough, we get a call back, he does the whole spine. The radiologist report simply said, well, it said no Chiari malformation, slight, a slight descendant of tonsils, which was completely wrong. Because when I got the films um, and waiting to go to a pediatric neurologist that our guy recommended us to in New Jersey and Morristown, I have like a, I'm like a research junkie and like there's a million surgeries in my family, so I have like the programs to read MRIs. I'm pretty good at that spine at this point. And so I'm looking and I'm like measuring it myself because now I'm like, oh no, that looks like least 10 to me. So I'm like, I don't. I'm like, what do I know? So sure enough, when we go to the neurologist, she looks at it. She measured it initially at 13. She, I mean, God bless her. She called the radiology department at St. Barnabas and went off on them. And, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and she, you know, she's a New Yorker, which I love. You know, obviously I'm from Brooklyn, Susie accent. But she, she's a Queens girl. She right away she called because this was such a gross misreading. Like this was, I mean, I'm a lay person. I measured it and knew it was at least 10. So she wanted the brain MRI. Just let's make sure, because we haven't gotten that. When I remember the brain MRI, I spoke to whoever was in charge. I'm like, listen, the guy who wrote this report, he ain't reading the next one. I'm like, I want somebody different. They wind up changing it to be that the, I think one tonsil they read is eight, and the other one was a little less at like six or something. So brain MRI confirms it. And you could see in, in her, uh, the form, like, it's, you're supposed to just have that one dot in the middle, that's the cord. She's got these two big, like, balloon things pushing against this dot. I was like, oh my God. Like, and they were surprised that she actually didn't have more symptoms like headaches and stuff, but she did. But incidentally, like I said, there were other little signs that you would never think maybe were, but could have been. So now it was deciding, do we get a surgery? Because if you look at all the research, all the, if you take just her variables, right? So adolescent girl, fully grown, just look at her specific variables. It does seem likely that a pressure on her spine could be causing the scoliosis, maybe. I mean, it just seems like a very good fit. So we go ahead, we said, all right, we'll do the surgery. I think, all right. Let's stop there for one second. <laughs> well, yeah. No, that's good, You're, this is amazing. Let's just stop, I just wanted to get like how you got diagnosed first. But that is how we got diagnosed. I know, that's good. I don't, <laughs> want, to, I don't want to jump forward to surgery deciding yet, okay? I want to let Jen tell oh, okay. her story a little bit about oh, how, we'll that. how he got diagnosed, and then that, because that way they, we can sort of share and, and work through the journeys we'll together. Through, yeah, surgery. Yeah, okay, right? got it, okay. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, Parker's Carey story is not a true hallmark textbook diagnosis. It's what we call, in a quick term, Parker's is a six month medical rodeo to find the expert. Um, just a typical afternoon, taking Parker and his sister to a well check that we had in town with his pediatrician. And this was six months post Parker at the age of almost 13, getting a letter from his middle school that he had failed a scoliosis screening. Okay, pandemic was taking place, didn't worry about it got an appointment with the pediatrician, and then that was six months later was the follow-up and we had this well check. And it was that well check that to this day, my husband and I and Parker are forever grateful for our pediatrician being so thorough. And on top of him and putting that in the back of her mind that she was just more thorough on his exam 
and the tone in his legs, the muscle tone was wrong. Something gave her a red flag that said, you know, this scoliosis, and we've just gotten another letter that he failed it again, because by now we're in another grade level. She said, you know, I just, I would just feel better if I refer you out to a neurologist. Okay. All right, no problem. So I don't think much of it. And then we had his sister, and I had to do her well check. And a few days later, I get a phone call from the neurologist office. But you know, that's going to take that's going to take a few weeks to get in. So we go to the neurologist. She was amazing. Another one who had an intricate part in helping us get Parker to the expert. And she said, "Do you know why you're here today?" And I said, "I'm going to be completely honest. I'm not worried. I trust our pediatrician. She's not going to waste your time." and we need to get to the bottom of this, and she trusts you. She said, excellent. She spends an hour with Parker and does a thorough job of an exam with him. And she said, does he always walk like that? And I said, yeah, that's just Parker. And she said, you know, I'm gonna order an MRI. I'm like, okay. I don't question her, I don't worry. Why, why do I worry? There's nothing to worry about until we get the images back. And she said to me, I will call you if there's anything concerning. That is an amazing doctor. And the day of his MRI, she called us at nine o'clock that night. And that's when our world turned upside down. I'm an educator, I'm a teacher, elementary, and I instantly became a student studying my child. The night of his MRI, she called us to let us know that she just received his report and he had curing malformation and my world stood still. He has what? Did I miss something in biology class? Like, you know, <laughs> like human growth and development, or what's going on? What did I miss? And she said, you know, it's gonna be okay. Many people don't find out till later in life. I'm not calling you specifically for this concern. I'm calling you because I'm more concerned. I found fluid at the base of his skull. Oh, and that's called a serenix. Oh, what? Well, it's like a cyst down this, and I need to get another image. And then, a little worry kicks in. As a mom, you start feeling guilty. Did I do something wrong? Is this when he fell one day? Is it like, what did I do wrong? Like, oh no. And your world stands still. And by the way, I don't recommend going on Google at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> I did not sleep that night. I think I told my story back to me and I was having a lot of PTSD when I was reliving this, but this is, this is just our journey. And today I don't regret any of the research and the education because as I said, I believe knowledge is power, and I believe that it took all of that journey to get the best care for Parker. So with that day and phone call, we waited, and she said, I'm gonna refer you to the neurosurgeon. Oh, that's a big word, Dr. Greenfield. Don't be scared of them. They're gonna be, you know, my second eyes, so off we go to the neurosurgeon. And it was a very good visit. Um, you remember that appointment? Yeah, do you want to share for a second? Yeah, you got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear how Parker and Izzy felt yeah. when they were given their diagnosis That'd be before great. we even get to the neurosurgeon. I think that that's really important for you guys to share how that made you feel and, you know, what steps did you want to take? Were you scared? Were you excited to have an answer? Oh, okay. No answer um, to the doctor's name. <laughs> uh, um, so when uh, to go back to the doctor that um, the, like found my care and permission and all that um, in the same appointment, she uh, pointed out on the MRI that I did not have um, sirens, yeah. sirens, whatever you whatever you say. Um, and uh, I she explained to me like the magnitude of the situation and that um, I was extremely lucky that I didn't, and um, in that uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to get um, the, like, you safer surgery, the one that is, they don't have that was just, plastic. it was a lot less scary to hear that I could get the surgery that I ended up getting, and not the one that I would have to get with the series. Um, and, um, Honestly, I wasn't really that afraid because um, I didn't, I, 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 my mom talked to me about a lot of symptoms and a lot of um, things that a curing malformation might cause. And um, I realized that for years uh, I was um, struggling with a lot of, uh, of the symptoms and I just thought it was normal and it was very not normal. And um, 
it was almost I, I felt almost like relieved to know that uh, I was it was finally gonna um, go away and I am uh, I'm a dancer but I'm mainly a singer and uh, I struggle a lot um, with uh, certain aspects of my performance because of my hearing I just thought like there was something wrong with me or like maybe I wasn't doing something maybe my technique was off but um, this was the answer to that and a lot of other questions that I had. And um, I, I'm not really afraid of like surgeries and stuff like that, especially because um, I heard so much good, so many good things about Dr. Refill and I felt um, very sick in his hands. And um, you could say in some ways that my world might have like flipped upside down, but I honestly don't want to be like that dramatic because it really wasn't, um, it wasn't, um, it was a big deal, but it wasn't really as scary as you might think it would have been. And um, I was already dealing with uh, my scoliosis, and uh, I was extremely excited to hear that um, this could possibly stop the growth, and hopefully I wouldn't have to wear my brace too long afterwards because that brace is the worst thing in the world. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you think she reacted worse over the brace than she did that she got one hundred. And then the only thing she cared about was how much of my hair you're gonna have to shave. Yeah, basically, because <laughs> I, I knew I was gonna be fine and. Um, yes, it was upsetting that I was getting some of my hair shaved off, but um, it was a lot bigger deal getting my brace and getting diagnosed with scoliosis than uh, the scarring operation, especially because the scoliosis, like, I feel like that or something, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, but the Chiari, it just, um, so you weren't really scared? Yeah. I don't, yeah, she really wasn't, I have to and say. And it was a relief getting the surgery, and um, I, I think if I didn't get the surgery, though, uh, it wouldn't have been that bad either because again the symptoms have always been there but um that's that was just my life that's just how i lived and uh i got used to that new normal so Thank yeah you. No, I mean, she really she handled it very well she wasn't afraid she wasn't i mean i think ignorance is bliss she's never had microphone oh sorry she never microphone what? Oh, I really? You can't hear me, mate. <laughs> um, ignorance is blessing, I think, too, because she's never had surgery, so she had no clue what to even expect. It was just like, yay, I'll be able to sing. And like, she was actually, she wanted to get it sooner so she could get out of school a month early. I was like, no, no, no. I just had an emergency, we'll wait till the end of the school year. But other than that, she really, we got, we were very, even though we did not go with the original surgeon, I will say she was very good at looking at Isabella, taking the time to explain to her what was going on and making her feel like it's not a big deal. I mean, it, and, and it didn't, you know, me wrong my hand, I thought she's gonna get brain surgery, but she's just, she was totally fine. Great. And I have to say, yeah, I was really, Thank but you. she's like that. She's nothing really bothers her. That was great. Yeah. Parker? Uh, <laughs> um, so when I uh, first got diagnosed, I really didn't care that much. I, mean, I slept with all my parents. And, uh, yeah, I, I probably should have been more like serious and cautious about what I was told, but I'm very like careless about a lot of things, so. I stuff it to her. You don't worry. Yeah, I'm just. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and we went to multiple doctors nearby around the, the Georgia area, and they all had different opinions on it. Um, one of the doctors that we went to, they um, they claimed that I did have Chiari. And then we went back three months later, and he undiagnosed me <laughs> for some weird reason. And like before, I didn't really care. My parents were all stressed about it. <laughs> yes, we were. Mm -hmm. Good luck, kids. And peripheral neuropathy, something like that. And uh, we went to other doctors. We eventually went to. New York after we heard about Dr. Greenfield and he told me that we had to uh, eventually get the surgery but not at the current moment and uh, at the time we accepted it we were ready um, again I, I didn't care I was 
ready, you know. Okay. And I mean, the worst that could happen was die peacefully in your sleep. Yeah. She said this all these things to Antonio. That's what she said. Do you think this is a good time to move away from Chinese speech? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about why we felt it was so important to go for multiple opinions. It sounds like from hearing both of your stories, you had local opinions and you decided to leave your local um, community and come to New York City. Not necessarily why did you choose to come here, but why did you feel that multiple opinions were important and when did you decide that you didn't need to keep looking? Um, well. You know, like I, I felt once I did my own research, because I, I knew nothing about PR, I felt pretty secure in the information I was given. Um, I, I mean, I was like, you know what, let's just book the surgery. I, you know, again, I, I do my due diligence, Castle Conley, all these lists, okay, doctor was not Mr. Chiari, but was in the realm of like, she, she's done it before. So then, but in the meantime, I'm doing my research and I come to us, your name, everywhere I looked. Um, when I decided, let me go to these, you know, Facebook pages, whatever, and constantly in Greenfield, Greenfield, Greenfield. I'm like, maybe we should get a second opinion from this guy. So I brought in, all, I sent in all my paperwork. Literally, it was a week and a half before I had the surgery at that point. Well, my life was like chaos by the time I got to it. And I begged Alexa. I wrote, I'm like, please let him just look at it. I need to know that like, I'm making the right decision. And I couldn't believe it. So it was five days before the surgery. He called me personally <laughs> in the evening, and I was like, "Mr. Piari is calling me. I'm telling my husband that I'm like ten because he's like a Piari superstar." So I mean, I was like, "Oh my God!" Because listen, I dealt with a lot of a lot of big surgeons in my family. We've had a bazillion surgeries. Big surgeons, you know, the top notch neurosurgeon, then New York Special Surgery here, there, and everywhere. They're not usually the most humble people in the world. <laughs> I could, he's calling me and you know, talked me through everything and like actually brainstormed to be like, well, well, I don't know if we should have, if you need to do it right away. Like, kind of, and then I told him more details about her scoliosis one in a dance company and when we talked about that it was like you know what this may be the best time to do it maybe we shouldn't wait because it is with all the other variables it is very possible that the scoliosis is being caught so like i'm like okay mr fear i just tell her she got the surgery and after talking to him i was like i gotta have it like i don't know how i'm gonna make this work and then this is where like you know you have angels because he was booked out till september and they had a cancellation the Monday before the Tuesday of my original surgery. I'm like, I'm all over it. Yes, I'll deal with the other surgeon. I was like, I couldn't believe it, but it's so important to get the opinions because, first of all, there's no, nobody's gone. Nobody's perfect. And it's always good to have different perspectives. I did get lucky. I mean, I've gone, I've had other things in my family where I've gone for multiple opinions and I needed to. I did get lucky because after the first person who knew enough to then go in, you know me one after him. Like it, he is the buck stops at Greenfield. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, am I wrong? Hang on. Am I wrong? Yeah, am I wrong? You were right. Thank you. All right. So that's it is really important to do your due diligence to go research, whether it's you go on Castle Connolly to find a specialist and go on. Facebook pages or any kind of social media where moms are talking. Forget about other professionals. You want to hear what moms have to say. You want to hear what other parents have to say. And I didn't read one bad thing. And all the things I did, people like, this is the person that needs to take care of my kid. Like that's it. End the story. So. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll, I'll um, just add to that that I think. You know, I, I very rarely will have a consultation with a patient where I don't suggest that they get other opinions. So I know this is lovely that, you know, Liz and Jenna are, you know, extolling our program's praises, but I think the idea of getting a new diagnosis and having something scary told to you almost, you know, necessitates hearing it from somebody else. Um, and I always say, look, get another opinion, call someone else, have your film sent around. There's nothing wrong with it. 
And if any surgeon anywhere tells you you don't need another opinion, then that's a red flag for you. Because I think anyone who's confident enough in their abilities and their decision making should feel comfortable that it's okay to get other opinions because part of what makes surgery successful is the relationship with your doctor, right? And so it's the idea that, you know, yes, not every outcome is perfect and there will be complications, but as long as you've got a good relationship, you have the foundation to work through that and to feel comfortable that they're gonna stick with you. So get opinions, feel like you can, you know, ask for, um, you know, multiple points of view, go outside your comfort zone. Um, most neurosurgeons that are in this field will feel comfortable rendering a casual opinion, you know, on email, um, on a quick phone call. Um, I'm not unique in this respect, and I know that, again, you're saying beautiful things, but I have lots of colleagues who do the same thing all the time, and we share information all the time, so there are a lot of really wonderful physicians out there. You just have to take the time and, um, and track them down. So I think if, if I could just extol anything from that, it would be to, to go and get those opinions. It's, it's super important. Yeah. Um, I will say, um, they minimized Isabella's kyphosis that she ended up at. She did have kyphosis in her neck, C3 to C5. I think it was worded as minimum, and, and he picked up, this is not minimum, this is moderate for sure. So again, it's a different set of eyes, um, and that matters because it is more moderate than it was minimum. So that would be another reason why he would want to, because a different set of eyes is going to see something maybe a little bit different that other people are not seeing accurately. So, how did we get to Dr. Grayfield? Why did we continue on the hunt? Because we had polar opposite views from top experts in our town who were highly referred. We had nothing against them. We felt uneasy in our hearts. Something was setting us off. One's diagnosing, another one's undiagnosing. The thing I learned with Kiari is Kiari is not a black and white disorder. Like, if someone gets cancer, there's a diagnosis, there's a plan. Kiari can do a hundred different things and no one's gonna have the same symptoms. Parker also didn't have textbook symptoms. He wasn't vomiting, he wasn't throwing up. He looked like a normal kid, but he was tripping and he was falling and he had the serenix. We weren't running around to try and find a doctor to confirm that he had the Chiari. We were trying to get to the root of the serenix and what we should do. So I will say, one of your good colleagues, a, a neurosurgeon in the network educated us for the first time. She was thorough, she was phenomenal, she guided us, she spent almost an hour with us, and she said, guys, this is a CRNX and this is an adolescent teen at the peak of his adolescence, growing, and that is a cry for help, don't ignore it. And we were like, what? She said, in my opinion, he needs surgery sooner than later. I went, like, define sooner than later. She's like, two months. What? So we go from, your kid doesn't have Gary, he's fine, come back in a year, see me. Your kid needs surgery. Now what do we do? Seek support from parents who've been in our shoes. That's when I heard Dr. Greenfield saying, go to some experts. You need a Curie expert. Okay. So we see a few more in town, still couldn't get confident answers. And we come up to we come up from Georgia to Dr. Greenfield and Alexa calms me down. I'm like on the verge of tears and I'm like, I just feel dumb being here because I'm confused and you know, and she validated all of my research. And then Dr. Greenfield came in, you don't need to cry, I'm here. <laughs> it was just really sweet. <laughs> no need to cry anymore, we'll get to the bottom of this. And he had studied Parker's case and he said, okay, the question no longer is, does he have Kiari or doesn't he have Kiari? Kiari is Kiari, regardless of the size. We need to look at the patient. And the question came down to his scoliosis is mild. It's only a 12 degree curve. And then that's when you shared, he's got fluid built up in the back of his brain. I'm like, what? And he just said, how's he sleeping? Let's get more studies. Let's not rush this. This is a very serious situation. We're like, yeah, this isn't Costco. Like if it doesn't work out, you can go to one surgery, you can go to another. You know, no, no, no. <laughs> this is like a serious situation here. And we want to make sure we can get data and confirm that we're gonna do the right plan for him. And like Parker, I mean, he said to us later that day, he's like, I don't wanna be stuck in a wheelchair. Remember that? I just wanted to add something to what you mentioned about getting more testing, because I think that comes up all the time. Um, what's the right testing to get and how much do you need? 
And, and I think the answer is not necessarily what you read on Facebook, you know, that there's like, these are the seven things that you need before you can get diagnosed. It's really different for every patient. Right. Um, and Amanda, Alexa, and I, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to, you know, really personalize the workup um, that's necessary. Some patients do come into the office and their symptoms and their scans are so significant, and the symptoms so severe, that we decide on surgery. And, you know, a sleep study would make a difference or a swallow study would make a difference. There are things that you would like to know to have data points and there are things that you need to know. And so um, there's not one cookie cutter list of things. We do ask for an honor intake can we get these studies from you? Have you had these studies? But you don't necessarily need to have them all for the evaluation to be meaningful. Um, you know, in a case like Parker's, there were some borderline things. You know, he did have a syrinx and um, he did have some mild scoliosis. But, you know, if you had met him, you would have thought he was a pretty, you know, happy and old kid. And so, you know, first impressions are first impressions. I was like, I'm not really sure this is something we need to rush into. Let's do a little bit more testing. You know, you know, in, Liz, in Izzy's case, we were a little bit, you know, more driven by the fact that things were progressing rapidly on the scoliosis, and we had some time emergency based on her age. And so, yeah, each patient gets a little bit of a different workup depending upon how they're presenting and um, the, the speed with which the symptoms are occurring. And so, don't necessarily be fooled as a trap that you need to get the same studies that someone else on social media got or that your neighbor got. Um, you know, get with you, your pediatrician orders, bring them to the neurosurgeon and see what they have to say. If you feel like you're getting enough work up, then you get a second opinion and say, I feel like maybe we need more decision making to be thorough and to feel comfortable in, the, in our decision before with surgery. But that was the reason why some of the workups were discordant between the patients. Mm -hmm. You don't need all the tests, you need a doctor that's going to listen to you. Yes, that matters the most. <laughs> all right, moving along. So what were some of your concerns, both of you actually, about having surgery in your car from home? And what actually happened? What did you think was going to happen? What were you nervous about, excited about? And then what was your experience like? Um, I'm not going to lie. Uh, when I was like in the hospital for the first day when I was thinking about surgery, um, I was like, oh, I'm going to have brain surgery, but I was definitely more scared of getting the blood test beforehand. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I mean, getting surgery, uh, I mean, I, I, it wasn't too far away from home, maybe like an hour, 30 minutes. Um, uh, it, I certainly felt, um, I want to say alienated, but I, I certainly felt a little like nervous out of place because I'm so far from home and uh, I definitely didn't like, like how, that, how that felt. Um, but uh, by... What about his staff? I mean, I mean how... Yeah, I was just about to mention that um, by Dr. Rayfield and his whole staff, I was uh, made felt extremely comfortable, extremely at home, and I really appreciated how every single one of them um, had less of like um, like an "I'm better than you, I'm a doctor, you're a child, you don't know a lot, listen to me" approach, and more of. Um, I'm here to help you. I'm a friend. I'm also here for you to ask questions, and I want you to feel comfortable with me. And uh, it felt great, and um, I couldn't be happier to be with Dr. Greenfield and staff. And I mean, he, he's amazing. He did my braids after surgery. <laughs> That's <laughs> not <laughs> great. I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, as I was getting put off to sleep in anesthesia. You know, I was I was like happy. I was fine. Like <laughs> yeah, um, and it, it I mean it, I felt fine. And the surgeons were smiling at me, and um, I it, everything went great. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I have to say, as a parent, also when you're considering getting the surgery, what made this experience? And again, unfortunately, I have family that's gone through a lot of surgeries. I've been there in the aftercare, whatever. What makes this experience so unique for me, as somebody who's done a lot of this, is the team, the care around. It was, I've never, ever experienced a care team that we had when with Dr. Greenfield's team. I mean, there was a child life 
that office or whatever. It's your big shit. I mean, she was holding her hand and just to do the blood work, and we were laughing. I mean, Izzy was on Snapchat taking pictures of everything with her surgery. I mean, it was just, and you, we, I mean, I felt, I can't even say we were in the OR. Like, you would think you would be really nervous. Here's my little girl, you know. I mean, what do you want to hear? She's very specific about the playlist. You had to play Coldplay, don't put it on shuffle. She was very insistent. I mean, they did everything though to a T. And so it's not only making sure you're comfortable with the diagnosis and your surgeon, but also the care team is a big factor because in my research, I did not find that was going to be the case with some other surgeons I was considering. Yes. This was huge. The care team is absolutely huge. You want your child to go in and not be afraid. And that's what I was afraid of. It was I was more, af my heart was more breaking because I had to think about, how she, I didn't want her to feel scared. You know, she was being more brave because ignorance is bliss. But once you're laying on that table and you've got the lights and that, no, I mean, she was just totally, because they made her feel that way. So that is also, I think, really important when you're, yeah. <laughs> Um, I had two serious worries about the surgery, but the problem was none of them were related to the surgery. <laughs> um, I, I had complete high hopes that everything was going to be okay. I mean, the chances of something was going wrong would be the same as dying from a golf ball. So, you know, it was, I, I knew I was completely okay on that part. But one of the worries was uh, what would happen at school for when I would return uh, if they make me make up months and months of work yep. that I missed out on. Um, luckily, they let me off, so that relieved me. But it, probably the biggest worry I had was missing missing the opening day of the Batman. <laughs> luckily, luckily, I got out of the hospital and I was able to see it that Friday release. <laughs> Thanks to an amazing neurosurgeon who fist bumps him as he's going into the OR. <laughs> We're going to make that happen. And I'm going, he's not going to make it to the movie in nine days. And they made it happen. <laughs> so the answer to your question is we live far. We had to fly. I was, we also wanted to think, we actually considered driving. And then other parents researched and educated me and said, if you drive, you're going to have to stop multiple stops so he doesn't get blood tests. I'm like, oh dear, this is a journey. We had children at home. We had a supportive family who flew in to take care of our children. Because I just knew Parker needed to be our priority. It's a lot to process because you can't, in the situation you're in, just run to any doctor with this kind of disorder and surgery. You have to be at peace and you have to know you're in the right care so that can all fade away. You have to know home is no longer your house. Home is gonna be where you're at with the community who's taking care of your child. And one of the most amazing and overwhelming things for us through the journey at our situation up here was behind every neurosurgeon is a nurse and an assistant and a doctor. Yep. And they make the package amazing. Yep. Because you build a relationship with them, they become family. I'm going to cry, <laughs> but it's truly an amazing experience when you're at a teaching hospital, and I'm a teacher, to know that those students in that OR room are learning from your child's case, and then they're coming later to do their rounds to check on your child. They want the best for your child. They care about you. And like having a neurosurgeon who puts your kid in that corner, it makes you feel like you're the only patient they have and wants the best for your child to live their best life and calms your fears and worries away means the world to you as a parent. Because you have so many doubts, you have so many concerns, you have doctors making you feel crazy that your kid needs surgery, doesn't need surgery, and you're like, I don't want my kid to have surgery, but I also don't want my kid paralyzed from this fluid, the Cerex. So the experience was top notch. And I can't say that like it's gonna be that case for everyone wherever they go because some have amazing doctors, but the hospital situation is not the greatest. Little plug here for you know Presbyterians being <laughs> in the world. Yes. Yeah, I can't I can't uh, emphasize that enough. I mean, I think the care that you get in the operating room is what everyone focuses on, but there's so much more that goes into it preoperatively and postoperatively in the follow-ups and the number of times that you'll interact with someone in your surgeon's office who's not the surgeon is probably 10 to 1 versus the surgeon. So you do have to feel comfortable 
that that entire team is there for you to take care of the, the issues that arise and to answer your questions. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we've done really well here is built up a team that is you know incredibly knowledgeable. Um, I think that uh, Amanda can probably you know hold her own with any neurosurgeon in the country in terms of workup or diagnosis or answering questions. That's because she's done it day after day after day. Um, and the team in the hospital is really important as well. In terms of traveling, I think it's I think it's a really um, tough question. And just like I tell families to get multiple opinions, I also will honestly, and you guys can tell me if I said this, you should really try hard to find someone that's close to home if you can. If you feel like there's an expert near you or you feel like there's a surgeon that you really feel comfortable with, it's gonna be easier. Like there's no question that traveling is hard. Um, and you know, I do expect families to you know, make a commitment that you're gonna travel out of town, that it's not hit and run, that they have to stay after surgery and they have to get follow up. And it's about a two week commitment. And so that's not right for everybody. And so, you know, I'll say, look, if there's someone here and I'll give names, you give cities, like try them, try them. Because I think that, that um, the support of your family, sleeping at home, having family to help your other kids is incredibly important to make it through that. So it doesn't work for everybody. For those who have the resources or the ability to make that work, it's obviously tough, but doable. And so I think you've heard a couple of different perspectives on, on how that can work. Thank you both for that. I remember one thing you said though, that you said to me, any patient I have is my patient for life. And that makes a huge difference. Yes. Yes. Uh, what were some of your concerns once you were discharged from the hospital and you went home back to your states? What did care look like? Were you nervous that you weren't down the street from us if something happened? What was communication like? Well, for me, I mean, we live in Jersey. We're literally, without traffic, we can get here in an hour. You know what I mean? With traffic, maybe a little bit more. So that wasn't, you know, and it's funny because um, the doctors um, I was originally going to use brought that up just said, you know, well, if there's any complications, you know, you're not right near here, you have to go there. And I was like, it's pretty New York. I mean, I'm like, oops, sorry. I just said, you know. <laughs> make sure I don't get in trouble with it. Um, you know, but like, I mean, for me, it's like, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, whatever. Um, I think going home to part of the concern was, uh, well, I think to some degree pain, but again, I mean, I don't know what's normal, what's not normal, if she's really the rock star, I think she is, but there was hardly, I mean, there really wasn't much pain. I mean, this kid got her head cut open and she, you know, they stressed, you must move your head as much as possible after you get up, you know, post-op because it will have less issues uh, the next day. And even though every time she would do it, it you know, because it kind of the delivery was off, she would throw up, she kept doing it anyway, you know. You do have that tenacity about you. I mean, sometimes you want to kill her for it because it's for the wrong reason, not <laughs> me, but in this case, she was, I mean, she was almost really 180 by the next day. I mean, she was, you know, it was amazing. And so I can't believe, you know, pain factor, they tried to, you know, they tried to send me home with some stronger medications, um, and not Greenfield seed. We didn't need that. I mean, she was on tour, well, she was, she didn't need any opiates. I would say, yeah, uh, it was less than 24 hours after the surgery, she was taking the tour of abortion. So the pain was really minimum in that degree. And so we really didn't have many concerns. I don't think you did either. You knew you were well taken care of. The only concern we had was right after where should we go? Because we have a million stairs in my house. We have a big staircase. Prior to, uh, I mean, Isabel is the kid who trips over a speck of dust, which made this chaotic. <laughs> well, look at, you know, this could be a thing. She's very, like, you know, wobbly, like you, every, I swear to you, two or three times a week, you'll hear boom, boom, boom with my house, and then I'm okay. And you don't know, like, you don't know what she fell on, but she fell on something. So um, that was my biggest concern. So we went to Grandma's house, who was with us. He met Grandma, who has a ranch not far from me. So, but other than that, would you say you had any concerns? Um, I was just more afraid of like. Um, what uh, I was gonna do myself, but she was like, I am constantly cracking like every bone in my body, oh, and uh, I was afraid that the muscle memory was gonna kick in. And it's just like one time, like a few days after surgery, I'd be like, okay, and then when feeling pain, I just, and then like it that because <laughs> I do that so often. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was also nervous about the tripping and falling part because I fall up and down the stairs uh, at least once a day. Um, <laughs> And um, I was a little worried to be discharged from the hospital so early. Uh, I was only discharged about 
two or three days afterwards. Um, so I asked my mom if we could go to my grandma's house because I didn't want to have to bother with the stairs. And um, uh, the noise in my house, because my house is always noisy. There's always people home. And um, being in the quiet was definitely, uh, it was nice. And just having a place to relax um, was really great. And um, uh, I, I was, I just, yeah. <laughs> well, I think one of one of the uh, one of the uh, and it could be cure sensory issues with Izzy is uh, the light really bothers her eyes. Bright lights and stuff would really bother her, and very sensitive to like sound. I mean, that's also why you have that like perfect pitch ear, and, you know, whatever. But at the same time, certain sounds. So she was, she definitely, she wanted to stay another night in the hospital. I was like, I slept on this uncomfortable thing for three nights. We're going home. But she really, she did. She, that's how great. That's how safe she felt there too. I mean, the care was astronomical. The nurses, I don't have a. There's not a bad thing I can say. For two to nuts, like you said, Cornell. I mean, just great hospital. Yes. Um, but other than that, yeah, I mean, you can't say we felt very great. And I knew they were, you were phone call all the way, Alexa, even Greenfield, it was just kind of like, all right, you know, worst comes to worst, I make a phone call. I get pain that bad, I'll take it to my pediatrician to get a shot of Toradol. We didn't worry, because we were not your first out-of-state patient for this big surgery. We also were able to, because we weren't in an emergency, we were being reactive to his symptoms because he did have a carry attack by um, six weeks after we had seen you and it was starting to get progressively worse and Alexa had confirmed that. So we were wise on his concern with missing school and we had a big break coming up after Christmas it was between the holidays and um, spring break. So we were able to take a whole week of his school off, come up. And I didn't have any worry because they weren't going to release us and send us on until they knew Parker was good. Um, and I was prepared for the mom that was going to have a kid that was going to be throwing up immediately after surgery. I was prepared for all of the things that could go wrong. And Parker defied it all. And they actually were calling him Batman in us. <laughs> and he was like superstar, like pacing through it. And um, day after surgery, what did you tell us? Uh, that I was lied to about pain because there was none. I mean, I was told it was going to be extreme, not extreme, but decent amount of pain after the surgery, but I felt nothing. I felt completely normal right after, which I was really glad about. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up with Kiari uh, my whole life, and I, it was just normal for me. And, I adapted to it, which is why there wasn't much pain at all, so. So I looked at Dr. Grindel and I'm like, did you really do surgery on him? <laughs> yeah, that's a carry kit. They don't know normal to release the pressure. And from there, it was smooth sailing. And then we fortunately did our homework and we had family very close by. So then we went and stayed with them before we went on to home and had outstanding care when it, they were just a phone call away. So it was great. And we stayed in town through his post-op. So it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I'll make um, one follow comment on both. I guess both the kids had really um, positive experiences in terms of the pain, and that's always a concern for kids and adults. And um, I think that's something that it's worthwhile talking to your team about when you're making a decision about where to have surgery, you know, what is the plan. I think earlier in my career, it wasn't as much of a focus. You know, we were so focused on figuring out what to do and how to do it. I think as the program has grown, we've really integrated our anesthesia team and the pediatric ICU team, and then coordinated that on the, outs on the outpatient side so that our patients really don't wake up with pain any longer because of, you know, collaboration with the anesthesia team and, and the PICU. And so we've been able to reduce narcotic use, improve discharge times, and you know, minimize the amount of um, medications that patients are apt to leave the hospital. So that's that's a real, you know, it's a real amazing thing to think about how we, you can integrate all the different aspects of a hospital in that way. And so I think that it's not necessarily unique anymore that experience. And so you know, if you're talking to your team about having surgery, it's worth all asking, what is the plan? And, you know, can, can we come up with a pain management plan for surgery, for anxiety pre-op, for recovery, and then for discharge? 
um, and particularly for patients who live outside of our state, um, we set up a post-operative pain management plan with a physician at your, you know, either your um, primary care doctor or pain management doctor because there are very, very strict rules about prescribing medications across state lines over the last several years. And so if you're getting, if you're an adult and you're getting a big surgery, you're getting a fusion surgery, that's particularly important for kids. Most of the kids are going home on minimal pain medicines these days, and so I think you guys are testament to that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think um, opiates, in, in that case, I, I think you said the same thing, which is not necessary. Like, I mean, she was fine on Motrin and Tylenol, and, you know, that was it, which I was glad about, you know, because I didn't want to have to go there. I mean, she's 12. Um, I mean, it, they offer to you the hospital, not the Greenfield team, but the hospital, just because I think it just, uh, it, some, it maybe makes you feel better. I don't know. I was like, um, so do you know there's an opiate epidemic amongst adolescents? I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. But we really didn't need it. I, in fact, I was like, is this not normal? Because I expected like a lot more. It might be, and like you said, if it's that, if it's in surgery, you're doing something, then that's it. But again, I also think it's a frame of mind to your kid going in and waking up in this environment. That's just amazing. I mean, it, ha it means so much. I mean, and like she's, and she came out of operation. I'm like, oh, who did your braids? And it was like, Dr. Mayfield did her braids. They were beautiful braids. And I, just when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, did we have the jackpot on life, right? And, and she felt so good that it was less than 36 hours. She had just gotten out of because it was two, yeah, it was probably about, I would say, 32 hours after surgery, Dr. Greenfield being Dr. Greenfield and very mindful of his patients, remembering that she was a singer. And so he sent in a music therapist. And so my daughter sang for the first time post-surgery, 32 hours after the most incredible rendition of Ari Maria that the whole way was coming in. And, but it was, the clarity that she sang it and the stress, the lack of stress free in her face. To, for her to be happy with the way she sounded was everything. And she said, it's like I have this big opening in my voice. So it was like we saw immediately, immediately, like some of the good effects of having this clarity. Yeah. Amanda, one thing I was gonna say real quick, and Dr. Greenfield confirmed and told us right after surgery. Now one thing that's hard with teens is, parents often say to me, I don't do surgery on the attitude. So Parker's coming out of surgery and the first words out of his mouth were, Dad, can you tell me where mom kissed me on my face so I can wipe it off? <laughs> and our kid was back and he didn't do anything wrong. The whip was still there and he wiped off the kiss that I had given him in the OR. <laughs> Up. <laughs> Those were the first words out of his mouth, and I will never forget that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's back. He is all there. Well, she was she was more pissed that she was getting sick all the time because she was hungry. She's like, I want to have food. Can I stop throwing up? I just want to note that it's not um, uncommon to have pain after surgery, and I don't want everybody to feel like they're going to wake up without pain. It's sure. okay if you wake up with pain, you let your team know. And I think what the takeaway is, is that the team will manage it accordingly. Absolutely. And I wouldn't want to uh, give you a lie that you're going to wake up pain free. Um, I think we do have rock stars and I think that a lot of our patients do wake up comfortable. But I wouldn't want to sell a lot if there's no pain at all. Well, I think that's, that's all it's all relative, too, because a lot of people, a lot of PRE patients are in pain before they come into surgery, right? They had headaches, they had, so it's kind of like relative. I mean, uh, well, she was, you know, because of the surgery, she had a girl for easy, she was, and many people made the mistake of asking her to rate her pain on the scale of one to ten. And, um, that's not a question too open-ended for someone like Izzy, so it became this whole like, well, what exactly is that? Well, I think t 10 is your whole body's burning and five is something like stubby. So it became like a whole thing like Dr. Reef was like, I think you're be thinking it, like welcome to my world. But I think it's all relative to each kid. And again, with PR makes they usually have pain already. So I think that's, to them, it's comparing it to that. I think in Parker's case, he was just, He'd been in pain so much his yeah. life. He didn't even know. Right. He had more stiffness. And we did. I mean, so he did have a setback. I called Alexa 
like three months in a surgery email Dr. Greenfield. He was having some upper back pain. We had to jump back into physical therapy. We knew he was feeling so good too fast and we just had to take it back a couple notches. So I won't lie and say that it wasn't painful. Do you remember any specific pain moments? It wasn't necessarily in the hospital, but um, a couple of days after I was released uh, in the hotel, I was taking a shower, being very careful not to get water over my stitching. And I started feeling really nauseated. Um, and so what I did was I shut off the shower, sat on the toilet for like 20, 25 minutes to just let the pain flow through and go away. So. It was completely unexpected, and it did happen, but I just, I just had to let it happen, so I go through. Um, I think for me, the burning question is, how has surgery changed your life? Not necessarily in terms of the symptoms that resolved or didn't, but how do you view the medical world? What advice would you give families in the future? How do you approach your health care moving forward? Um, I'll answer uh, as many questions as I can. <laughs> <laughs> three weeks. We should say that you're yeah, just three weeks post up. Three weeks post up. Um, but uh, one of my biggest concerns coming out was definitely my scar and uh, my hair because I love my hair. Um, but my scar uh, is looking it better than ever, extremely well. Um, and my hair is growing back significantly, and um, you can barely see it too. Turn around. Right. <laughs> 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 it's three weeks. Wow. All right. It looks pretty great. It feels pretty great. Um, uh, as uh, uh, it reminded me that I even in three weeks I am experiencing upper back pain, but it's not like motion pain. It's more. Like I need a massage and physical therapy pain, um, except I I don't think that's uh, too much of an ac accurate representation because I'm still wearing my scoliosis brace and because of the way that it uh, positions me in my spine and my back and all that, um, it already uh, like exacerbates the the all my back pain and my neck pain. Um, uh, I would. Um, I would say that uh, if, because I am very um, aware of how others view me, I would say if you're worried, especially if you're a girl with like long hair or what long hair, and um, you're worried about how others will view you, I say um, to really not worry about that because that's not important. I know that's not like a very really big thing, but to me, it is. Some, some kids um, may struggle with that, and uh, just know that like you're not alone. And um, in that, uh, the, the pain, um, if you do experience pain, it's like, it's all relative and um, that, um, that you should take it easy and not, because I was, I, I was out quickly. I was feeling good quickly. And then um, I didn't have any like severe nausea attacks or anything afterwards, but I did notice when I got a little too overconfident um, that I would get dizzy and um, I would feel a little sick and that not to, um, you know, not to get to a concept, not, not to uh, push past your limits. And um, I, I, I guess. That's great. Um, how has Izzy surgery changed your life and what advice would you give families moving forward? Um, well, I mean, it's it was still three weeks post op, so I'm still kind of living in it where she was home every day, constantly bored. Not going. Well, her ADHD meds, not, but it's so. <laughs> um, Now, this week, this is a uh, third week post op, she's actually in uh, camp, an actor's camp, which is not strenuous physically. So, my biggest joy is hearing her when she's singing and how effortless and how happy she is and not beating herself up and not knowing why she's not sounding the way she is. 
And I just, my biggest piece of advice is listen to the aftercare instructions. Um, she can, I'm a rule follower, like to a T, and she's not. <laughs> so I'm always like, but you can't do this, you can't do this, like, you know, and um, she should be wearing a scoliosis brace, but she's not. I got it. Well, she didn't figure out it. I don't know. I'm going to forget to turn on the phone tomorrow. What do you make up? Um, so she should be wearing the AT necklace today. That's my, my biggest thing is dealing with Kiyomi and scoliosis. Now the most important piece of this puzzle for us is she's got this huge weight of bricks off of her spine that's working against this brace helping her now is the time to be wearing the brace to help straighten the spine she could also actually maybe get some of the curve reduced if the PRA is what's going to stop the progression um so that's the frustration there but other than that I can't really say I'm just I have a renewed faith, I have to say, in the medical community. This, that, and again, that's because of our experience with this particular doctor, Mr. Chiari. Um, but it definitely gave me a renewed experience because I had yet to have an experience in a hospital. Like we had from soup to nuts to the doctors to the nurses to the people who, the woman who came and gave her her food. I mean, like everybody was just, it was just an amazing experience. So. Um, my, you know, just be comfortable where you're going. If you're gonna, you know, do your due diligence and, you know, feel so, I felt so safe bringing my child there and I felt so safe with any of the aftercare I was getting. So just make sure that you feel those things before you go ahead and do anything. I'm a year and a half post-surgery right now and most of the time I completely forget about my scar back here. It's, I mean, it's like, it's like it never happened, even though it did. And, I mean, it's really nice because um, you don't have to stress about um, all these situations because it's all passed now really quickly. And, I mean, I'm on my feet, moving like a normal person would, and um, life's been treating me good, so yeah. Yeah. So one thing Parker we didn't share was he was tripping and falling, and that was because he had the he was off on balance with the fluid in the back of his brain. So he actually joined the track team, and he couldn't run before that. He was tripping and falling. So it's like a joy. He's this quick, um, short distance sprinter. Yeah. So it's just a joy to be on the other side of surgery, have it behind us. The theory doesn't define us, but it's forever a part of us yeah. to advocate and educate and research and knowledge is power and to share as, you know, the greatest people in the world are storytellers and just sharing your journey makes it more hopeful for others that there is answers. There is, there is people in the medical world that you can trust that do bring you hope, yeah. who bring help to your child. They really are there. And they do care. I mean, I think it's super important too is become a researcher. Like I, my philosophy is do as much research as you can. I like what? Yeah, I mean, I she turned me on me with doctors because they tried other doctors who try to tell me something, and I'm like, no, that's not the case. And I pull out clinical stuff, and they're looking at me, and some one condescending one said, oh, you did your homework, and I was like. Really? Like, <laughs> so, but it's always better to go in knowing just as much as then if you could, possibly, but just know, because it's a lot easier to get the answers. You know the questions to ask if you know the information, right? Rather, so you'll know what to ask them and you can get the information that you need. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to our journey now. You're a year and a half out, so I'm looking forward to the journey of What's, what's going to happen with the scoliosis? Will this stop the progression? I love the research and the work that Dr. Greenfield is doing here and finding out more about it. Um, I also know, you know it's only a handful of cases where Sanders and Chiaris have been studied and this actually helps Sanders. Um, a lot of her ADHD symptoms, if you listen to any of other uh, conferences that 
Dr. Greenfield has had, one of them was specifically about the cognitive effects of PRE and like where they're going with the studies. Isabella happened to have a neuropsych eval a year ago. I'll probably give her another one just to see, um, to measure, to see if there's any differences. I'm really excited to be part of that community to see, oh, okay, let's see, you know, how much is PRE affecting cognitive skills? There's still so much to know about it, and I'm so happy to be part of the community that's going to help you know, with a certain set of variables like we have with Izzy, which is because everybody's different. So um, it's really great if you can be with a surgeon, if you can be with a team. I think researching hospitals and surgeons are probably the best. I mean, would you agree, Jen? I agree with you. Because they so. just, well, there's always, there's a, they're always on top of whatever's the newest. And, you know, yes. I'd like to interject. I think we have time for one more question, but this does bring us to a good point. What resources did you find helpful yes. in your journey? I'll start there because <laughs> that's how it was. I was six months of a journey. <laughs> exactly. Um, it really was me and Albert and I found the Bobby Jones Foundation, and they had his name on there, and then through the Bobby Jones Foundation, his name on there matched the Kiari Malformation Pediatric Support Group. They matched. And when you keep seeing these doctors, then you do research. And then on the Cornell page, there's actually stories, Kiari stories. And it made you feel better as a mom. Okay, okay. And like some of them were on their way to go with another doctor and then they just had this, I need to get a second opinion, I need to get a second opinion. So the resources were the Bobby Jones Foundation because there was a wealth of information on there. There were videos. I think I even showed one of the videos, Parker, like how to explain Kiari to your kid. Um, the parent support group really was a blessing for us. I only allowed myself to do 15 to 20 minutes a day because it can get overwhelming. I just gave myself 15 to 20 minutes a day. I couldn't get overwhelmed. And then I found moms that were able to reach out to me to help me. And then the other resources was just um, finding a medical team to support you, to guide you, because it's not just the doctor. It's before you freak out, you gotta call the nurse and be like, is this normal? Is this something we should be worried about now? Because that's what guides you to the right plan. And then other doctors in town that were telling us, this is something you should be concerned about, you know, that all led us. So there really are good support groups out there, but it's the Bombay Jones Foundation and these other support groups that match so much of the wealth of information out there that helped us. And before my mom continues, I should say, because I forgot to mention it for the last question, um, for other patients that experienced ADHD and that went through the surgery too, I did notice that when I'm off my medication, it, um, it lessened some of my ADHD symptoms. I've noticed that I've been able to concentrate and focus um, like better. And uh, I did notice, though, my uh, psychiatrist also mentioned that it's pretty common that my medication might react differently with me after the surgery and I have noticed that has been happening so to be aware of that um uh, so to I mean I agree with Jen the specific the QRA specific QRA organizations again though um I'm I really look up medical journals look at the x-rays know the parts of the brain I mean that's how I am I need to understand every facet of what's going on uh, in the anatomy of her brain why you know because I like to be able to visualize and understand okay yeah that makes sense and there's this big weight sitting on her spine the pressure was probably making her spine curve a little I just find that the scientific knowledge besides the support of other people um, really 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 empowers you as a parent um and you're able to then envision everything that's going on and, and it makes sense make it make sense i i can appreciate other people's perspective but i'm the kind of parent that i need to see it i need to understand it i need to know exactly what's going on and you know yeah, that's that's for me i mean but i think one thing to answer many of your questions he's a year and a half post surgery and uh one of the greatest follow-ups for us was three months post surgery and Dr. Greenfield was like, look, I'm not God. I can't predict his future, but I can tell you statistically, if we do the surgery, this and this, and three months post-surgery, his serenex had completely shrunk by over 50%. Wow. And that's huge, because that was a huge step of faith. And we can't guarantee that it's ever gonna go away, right? And it may not ever go away, but it already improved 
So he no longer has symptoms. So we have anything more to say on that? <laughs> well, um, I, I think what I'm, you know, what everyone should be taking away from this is that you know these journeys are all incredibly personal, um, and everyone has a sort of a different journey that they take to get their diagnosis, to find their team, and their recovery. And yes, we're, you know, I've obviously picked two moms who love to share their stories. Um, they would be really great advocates for the field and for their children, and they've obviously proven me right. Um, but, you know, I think there, there are a million different stories out there. And so the point of tonight is to understand that every, every situation is different, to find your comfort zone, to find your team, to do your research, talk to the nurses, talk to other families, talk to multiple doctors, and you'll begin to get an understanding and appreciation for what it is that you're trying to affect when you're talking about thinking about surgery. Surgery is not to fix an MRI scan. I think that's the most important thing. Surgery is to improve a child's quality of life, to improve scoliosis, to make them sing better, to make them feel better, to have them join the track team. These are sort of tangible examples of how we can improve kids' lives by doing this. It's not about is the herniation five millimeters or not? That is so 20 years ago. This is about finding a team that understands that your child is unique, that they have a unique set of circumstances, unique pathology, and finding a team that is willing to work with you to get beyond that, to get your child onto the other side of I have Chiari into I had Chiari or I'm past Chiari. You're always gonna have that, it's always gonna be a part of who you are, but you know, if you find that team and that support network, getting on with normal life is gonna be much more likely. So. So I thank them very much for joining us. Do PRs get worse? Like, I mean, um, like if we didn't address something now, the problem was looking ahead, these issues could get worse. Was that one of the things that could happen when you don't address it? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for every child it's different. For someone with scoliosis, surely progression is something that we're really concerned about. With scoliosis, it's one thing. With syrinx, it's another thing. There are symptoms that progress. There are a lot of symptoms that stay static. and just sort of linger there in the background for years and years. Well, so I remember you saying the risk to reward was worth it. That was a big thing, too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank our panel, our patients, parents, Bobby Jones, Dr. Greenfield, participants. Uh, we will be around after if you have any questions or concerns. Um, I thank you for joining us, and I think we should all give each other a round of applause.